I suggest that we get started while our friends take their seats. We are now going to talk about the economic side of this uh, disrupted international scene. We'll be talking about uh, outlooks on growth and uh, economic demands and on competition between markets and powers. Uh, should we be afraid of a, a slurred, slowdown? Should we be afraid of uh, technological battles? Uh, should we be afraid of uh, uh, markets closing down? We will be analyzing all of these subjects uh, with uh, four people that I would like to invite to come up to the stage now. I'd like to, Denis Ronk, who was very punctual today. He is uh, president of the Academy of Technologies. He's also a member of several boards and he is also a major industrial player. So as I said, he's president of the Ac Academy of Technologies, which of course uh, is a major subject uh, in, re in regards to international competition. I'd also like to ask uh, Pat Patrick Brandmeier, Director General of the Franco-German Chamber of Commerce and Industry to please come up to the stage. Thank you for being with us to tell us about your Franco-German experience in business. We also have Catherine Luboshinsky, who is Professor of Economic Science at the University of Paris. She's with us. She's uh, just like Rachel, she's all dressed in red. Thank you, Catherine, for being with us today. And I'd like to I also recognize that she is from Poitiers in our region. So thank you very much for being this. And Sumit Anon, who is president of the French Indian Chamber of Congress and Commerce and Industry and founder of Insit Growth Partners. He came from India to participate with us today, just like Andrew Cheng came from China. I suggest that just like we do every year, we first listen to a video from by from Jean-Paul Bebez, who will be telling us about the tectonics of continental economics. He participated in the creation of the future, so, and uh, just like you, Catherine, he always has a, a very uh, good insight on the subject. Good afternoon. Tectonics of Continental Economics. Uh, what kind of a title is that? And in fact, what is the reality of that? That reality is that of the fact that the dreams that we had, have had for years, are fading away. The first dream was the IT dream, which, by, according to which uh, growth would uh, increase throughout the world. That was the grand moderation. The second dream was the climate dream. The idea was that thanks to the COP21, all the countries in the world would be making efforts together to slow down uh, a moderate, uh, the, to slow down climate change. And the third dream was uh, the diplomatic dream that the United States and China would do everything they could to avoid find, um, conflict. In other words, the U.S. would accept that uh, the, P the GDP, Chinese GDP, would rise until the um, the same arrive in the same level as the American GDP. But that's not all. There was also the dream of the Trump deal. Trump wanted to make a deal with China by which China would uh, buy more goods and services uh, from the United States uh, in order to reduce uh, the American debt and the growth of both countries would advance without, with less 
uh, tension. And then there was also the problem with it, with a certain virus, and we thought that at the, the beginning that the virus would stay in Wuhan, or at least in China. No one thought that it would become a global pandemic. And I, this is what we could call the grand illusion. And all of this brings in a new world, a different world. And the, the combination of IT and COVID-19 interrupted the production chains, uh, which led to uh, problems with uh, inflation and uh, increased salaries. Second difficulty is uh, the link between the climate change and the war in Ukraine attacked by uh, Russia. And this has a tremendous uh, impact on the price of gas and the price of uh, oil, which can, is rising continuously. Finally, third element, uh, China and the United States uh, went through COVID and uh, China is getting back on its feet more quickly than the United States. And then when COVID arrived in Europe and Europe has even more difficulty than the others uh, getting back on their feet. Uh, so, but that's not all. Then Trump is uh, still thinking seriously about the 2024 election and he will be running in the United States, which is less more divided than ever. But that's not all, because we also have the, the war, the Russian war on Ukraine, which is becoming long term. And finally, there are the uh, the results of uh, the uh, pandemic and the, the stops in production, the rise in, in in salaries and the increase in, on the exchange rate for the for the dollar and uh, the increase in salaries the price increase of gas is uh, the price of gas is increasing and this is going to lead to problems with growth so in other words we have uh, the perfect combination for stagflation especially because when prices increase central banks increase uh, interest rates uh, and that in, is also a, a, a threat to growth, which leads to another strange uh, phenomenon called, known as a slump inflation. And that's what happens when growth growth slows. This is maybe what's happening in the United States. This may be what happen, is coming soon. Uh, or, or threatening to occur in Europe and in France. And so that's what's happening today. Those are short-term threats, but that's not all, because there are also long-term consequences. The long-term consequences are, are in, have to do with the global risk problems on uh, problems in Africa, not only in Northern Africa, but also in Sub-Saharan Africa. Who will be managing these countries? How are they going to govern these com com countries? Uh, the question is very complex. And then in Asia, there is tension between China and India. How are those two major powers going to find a negotiation? And finally, the emerging countries who are threatened by m numerous difficulties, interest rates are going to rise, the, the exchange rate for the dollar is going to rise, fa famine is coming, and that's still not all because uh, there are other changes in our world. We, there are also uh, bellicose uh, tensions, uh, uh, nuclear threats, uh, new forms of black mate, blackmail in a world where empires are trying to come back. Uh, 
China is consolidating its empire. Russia dreams of reconstructing the, the Soviet Union empire. The Persian empire, in other words, Iran, is trying to see how they can re-establish their empire. And then Turkey dr um, dreams of reconstructing the Ottoman Empire across the seas. So all of these old empires are trying to grow back again. And then they, caught, they come across Europe. Europe is uh, what stops these em empires. Uh, and today's Europe is, uh, feels uh, is fra fragile. We can see that by what's happening in, in Italy, but also in France. We have to, the, the, we have to reinforce relations between France and Germany, but that's not enough either. Europe wants to be, has to want to be a major power in this world. That's the main challenge that we're faced with today. Thank you. So that was a very uh, convincing demonstration, which corresponds to what we discussed already a bit this morning, uh, the uh, need for a, a Europe that should not be remain obsessed by its own market problems. So, Denis Rank last night said that he was a former player of the industry. He is a, was a part of the founders of the Thales Group, that major group which works in innovation, also uh, in in defense. And so, when we talk about Europe and defense, uh, I think he has something today because. And now we're walking, we'll be talking about the economy, and I'd like you to give us an overview of our economic situation. Thank you very much, Mr. Prime Minister. Thank you for having invited me. So I am a former industrial player. I'm going to tell you about my own experience. And I'm going to tell you about the technology in industry and the disruptions that we talked about a little bit this morning. I was struck to see that technology is, tech is present everywhere. That's what enables some of our listeners today to be listening just as closely across the internet as the people in the room here. Technology also it plays an important role in transportation, hospital, care, and of technologies, of course, new technologies are at the heart of our, our disruptions. They're also sometimes the cause or the, they can be the tool of those disruptions. And so that's what I wanted to base my talk on when I talk about the technology in Europe. Techno new technologies are the causes of movement. They are in, they are represent the best and the worst of the new worlds. For example, uncontrolled social movements uh, like those uh, who that that are not part of a, a democratic movement, like those who like the uh, attack on the Capitol in, in Washington. Uh, and, and things like that are favor are promoted by social networks, uh, just like with the Gilets Jaunes, the Yellow Jackets movement in France, by changing the algorithms in, in uh, social networks, uh, additional weight can be given to the people who are in a certain vicinity of a certain point. But then there was also the lockdowns which help, and for which new technology helped us to, to withstand. Ten years ago, people didn't have computers or tablets at home. And 
For example, in, at Airbus, we stopped work for just one work and then one week and then we went back to work again. So technology is ever present. Sometimes it's seen as something that's difficult to control, difficult to master. New technology has made, helped us keep peace in Europe. It's also new technology that's at the heart of the, 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 war, the, the war that's ongoing now. We're not sending troops to the war in Ukraine, we're sending technology. And that technology in our society is fascinating because it's both an object of desire and a, both a, an, an object of, of fear or wariness. In, in, in the met, Paris metro, uh, at, you can see nine out of ten people, I actually counted nine or ten people are watching something on their screens. But people are also wary uh, of uh, new technologies uh, in Europe, in the United States, in, in, tech, in uh, democracies particularly. We tend to be wary of new technologies. Technology has been the instrument of progress now, though, however, for the next past two centuries. Uh, but uh, we don't have slogans like technology is everything, or we, we, we talk about technology for progress, which is well selected and well shared, because we believe that progress, uh, technology is a source of progress for humanity. And when you think that it only took us one year to come up with a virus for a vac for uh, excuse me a, a vaccine for a virus that was unknown until now, it's the new technologies that have helped us helped us uh, to create that uh, make that vaccine. So progress, absolutely unquestionably but reasonable progress. We are the de descendants of the of Descartes and the Age of Enlightenment, so we try to fight against fake news and phony experts. Our technology, our industry, our society has to continue to base itself on reason, and this is more and more difficult. We're in a democracy, it's, we're not going to impose anything on, on our fellow citizens, that doesn't, doesn't work, but we've seen situations, cases where where people talk about um, ideas uh, by which uh, the vaccine injects uh, chips into your body and that you will then be controlled by the government. We have to take time to explain things, to avoid those sorts of uh, fake news. Not to explain, not by explaining to people that they don't know what they're talking about, but list, by listening to people and trying to explain things. And we also have to share information because uh, technology is not just to make certain startup founders rich, even though if they are able to become rich through technology, good for them. So, but we do want technology to be an element of humanism. Clearly, historically speaking, if we don't, if we forget about the, the invention of uh, fireworks and by the Chinese and mathematics in the Arab world, the Europe has been at the at the forefront of technology for many centuries now. Today, well, the, Europe was at the heart, at the heart of technology. Today, if we compare technology in the U United States, States and technology in Europe, 
We, Europe, the, the GDP in Europe is about equivalent to that in the US and in China. Technically speaking, however, tech, Europe has 28% of the world's researchers. Well, our GDP represents 20% of the world's GDP. So, and we have, and we represent 28% of research publications as well. However, in terms of spending, the United States represent 26% of spending and for research and for patents, China has 32% of 32% for China, 32% for the United States, and only 14% for in Europe. But Europe is still very present in terms of for for research in the academic world. And it's a little bit different for the application of technologies and their economic value. So what are our strong points and our weak points? Well, we will have to, we'd have to talk about uh, um, the different sectors, uh, healthcare, et cetera, separately. But Europe has created an internal market and we use that as to to build ourselves and to enrich our citizens and to we hope to help them understand that Europe is part of the solution and to also create prosperous uh, businesses. But when we look at the situation, we realize that there needs to be regulation for health, telecommunications, even aeronautical industry to some extent, but there is a bit of an exception there. But what we see is that it's not uh, homogenous, and that to some extent a number of states have given up sovereignty, for example, over foreign trade, the unified market, yet we have maintained national sovereignty for a number of issues such as defense, telecommunications a little more challenging for health as well. One good exception is agriculture and farming, which is a European level competency. So this market for industries, well, industries are the ones who rely on it the most, these most sensitive industries, but the European market is not the dream that many people once had. So companies, nevertheless, they have made the best out of the given situation. While uh, governments maintained very national level regulations of many industries, again, with the exception of the aeronautical industry very early off, and that was a very good thing at the time because it is a global industry. Well, the air space is an in international space. But air security, we have the European agency and countries willingly handed over their competency to that level and everything has been going fantastically and, and it's brilliant. And it's brilliant because when you have a new Airbus, you don't have to uh, go through 27 different agencies to have it authorized. You just need to go through the European agency to go get it authorized. So that is the great advantage of having a unified European regulatory body, which isn't the case for all industry. When it comes to telecommunications, there are multiple operators out there and we had to adapt to the changing situation. Thales, for example, they wanted to go to multi-domestic markets, not multinational markets. So they have a, a local uh, a local brand, it's a Brittany in other regions of France, but they also have uh, businesses out in Australia. So we adapted and for China and Australia, it's very understanding, but it, understandable, but for Europe, it's a little different because it's hard to have a European wide synergy. So we have to come up with subsidiaries that are somewhat independent, but still have to abide by national levels, regulations, Airbus, global regulation. So they have to specialize their respective sites, all of the wings, uh, are made in Britain, in Great Britain. Everything else is made in France, Hamburg. The fuselage is in Germany as well. 
And that is the way that we have been able to maintain Affectio Statis. And that is done through Airbus. Again, for car manufacturers, cross borders. But it's not optimal. The other characteristic of this market is that uh, for a long time, it privileged competitors over consumers to create uh, industrial champions. Now, I'm not going to give you a history lesson here, but a lot of mergers were actually uh, went, went through and very few are refused or do not get the green light from the commission. But because of that, there were actually some uh, some mergers that were never even put to the commission simply because people thought that they wouldn't go through. So given the liberal economics trade, which is fairly balanced, despite the fact that China, well, China trade isn't necessarily balanced, Europe is a bit of a champion and it hasn't long been an issue, but it is starting to become an issue. How are we going to deal with an open market that favors only consumers when all around us, em empires are being built up with national champions are protected? And this is an issue where I think Europe has been bringing in some change, but I think it needs to bring in more change. Currently, economically speaking, the world is block against block, geopolitical block against geopolitical block in the past. And whether it's a weakness or a strength, what we've seen is the great thirst, the general thirst that people have for technology. So people are drawn to it, the younger generations are drawn to it. And we see that in our countries, so many people use technology nowadays, it's probably used too much. And oftentimes it's actually creating certain levels of immobility where people can't see eye to eye on issues anymore. So when you think about uh, garnering general support for a nuclear power plant, the EDF in the past, it was quite easy to garner that support, but nowadays it's a lot more challenging. And maybe that's because of the technology, who knows? And it's very hard to have a very calm, collected, countrywide conversation on some topics. And it's been hindered because of technology. Now, while technology helps that conversation, it hinders it. Another, another topic that is very interesting when it comes to Europe is education and there is a lot of research and university level work that is being done Europe wide but what is concerning for uh, countries is when it comes to mathematics for example I know too well how tough it is because we have some fantastic French engineers that are of world-renowned quality and they really hold their own up against Chinese, British and American engineers. And when we look at the university rankings, the, our university rankings are really being pulled up by our performance in maths. But year in, year out, the our performance in mathematics has been dropping, unfortunately. And the basis of the educational pyramid is based in maths, and unfortunately, that is slowly being eaten away. And that is an issue. Now, it's not an issue for the Sciences Academy, which is in charge of French excellency, but it's really an issue for industry. Industry needs to fight and fight hard to put in the means to practical means to train up our future engineers. Now, there was an issue that we touched on this morning, so I won't spend too much time on it. It's talking about the European economy. The European economy has really been able to build itself on a bedrock of fundamental values, shared values. So we have values, we have fantastic education, we've got solidarity, and we have European-wide technology. So that brings us all together. But the counterpart of that is that we see sometimes some level of conservatism. When we compare Europe to the United States, it's sometimes very hard for us in Europe to emerge and break out because you have to deal with 25, 26 different markets, not just one. We want to see people, people now, they want to live more comfortable lives. Now, we can't deal with the global challenges we currently 
facing if we don't rethink and overhaul our values, our morals, and that starts in primary school. And we're talking about what can be done. Well, we can turn our eyes to European leadership, and I think there's cause to feel reassured. Because this is a long race, and we don't want to be leading this race. We don't have to be in pole position. While the Americans are leading the charge for certain areas, the Russians also as well, being second and third is perfectly fine. And it's quite a comfortable position, in fact. Because we can learn from the mistakes of the first, of those people who need us, and maybe it is actually better off being in second or third position. Now, that said, you still have to be in the race. You have to still be in the running. And while talking about races, there is a race, another race, a race for the climate. And Europe really does need to be exemplary in this. We need to be a role model when it comes to climate policy. And again, this is a race, and maybe this is one way we want to be leading the charge, but we don't want to be running this race alone either. Because if Europe is alone, the only player in the world to really knuckle down and bring forward sound climate policy, to really implement a proper decarbonation policy, obviously it shouldn't be to the detriment of our jobs and our economies, then we will need to find ways to balance that out. And also we need to be consistent. Technology, technology is fine, everything holds together. We have energy, energy networks, and they work because we have digital networks. Health is now done with technology. Technology is everywhere. Physi chemistry, advanced ke physics and chemistry, keep it all together. And keeping that consistent working together is fundamental. I remember when we want to put a price on carbon. Well, that caused a bit of a debate, and now we actually want to uh, we want to put a subsidy on carbon, and it doesn't make sense for a lot of people. And that just shows that we have a long journey ahead, but we need to be consistent along that journey. So yes, we need to ensure that people can still have the liberty to 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 set up a an enterprise, but we also need to ensure that we protect liberties and freedoms of others. So it's a fine balance to constantly strike. Uh, if Europe has been a place in which we could move towards a free, free market in our own time while the rest of the world was going much faster towards a free market, I think we need to, to ensure that we can do that, but ensuring that Europe remains powerful and for power, Europe to be powerful, we need to be efficient and effective. And we can't have European events run by a community of members without that. We need to have European diplomacy. We need to have a European Parliament, your European Congress. We need to be truly federalist. We need to do this as Europeans all together. And we need to overhaul our entire European political identity to achieve that. Because if we don't do that, then we will have hard days ahead. Jean-Pierre Arvrain yesterday said that we have so many young people now fighting for the climate, whereas a few years ago they didn't care about it. And who knows, maybe in 10 years now, those same young people, the critical generation of our world, they will be, they will be calling for something that we haven't yet thought of. So we need to show that we can act now and beat them to the punch. Thank you. Thank you very much for those comments, for outlining the essential aspects that Europe needs to be a true power. Well, it's not just in trade, obviously, but a, it's a Europe that is powerful, but it's also a Europe that causes concern for some people within its own borders. Because if we want to have a true Europe, to have a Europe of defense, then we need to have a federal Europe and a common strategy. Patrick Bonmeyer, you are you are General Director of the Franco-German Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Can you tell us a bit about your take on the pressure that we are feeling from America and China, but also uh, what we can take away from the U situation in Ukraine? What can the French-German alliance bring to the table? Is Europe weaker or is Europe now picking up more momentum? And I'll give you 10 minutes. If you get to 12 minutes, I'll cut your microphone. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to thank you for the invitation and thank you for having me here. My name is Patrick Bonmaier. I spent 25 years working for Siemens on the industrial side, and then three years ago, I took over the I took over the general directorship of the Franco-German Chamber of Commerce and Industry, which has been around for some 60 years, ensuring cooperation between our two countries. If you will just bear with me, I would like to present what I have today in three main sections to discuss the relationships between our two countries in terms of economics, obviously, first. And then I would like to talk about what it means for Europe. And the third, if I have the time, I would like to make a few comments on Russia and China, as has already been mentioned today. So having listened to everyone speak so far, I would still like to say that the, the situation, the observations we make are that the situation is quite concerning. Now, despite how concerning it is, I would like to give you some good news, because when I look out my window, the Franco-German friendship and relationships the relationship is quite good, quite strong. Economic partnerships is a great strength for our two countries, but also for Europe. Now, why do I say that? If we just look at the figures, currently our two countries have an overall trade of 164 billion euros. This is from 2021. So obviously, we're coming out of the crisis in 2021. So that's the first observation we can make. Our two countries have almost reached the level of trade that we had before the crisis. And they were quite too strong years for our two countries in terms of economic indicators. Second observation, we are deeply tied. Germany today is the largest customer and the largest supplier for France. So there is a lot of inter-trade between our two countries. They depend on each other. And I think that is a good thing. Because with that comes an, a level of shared risk. And that's a fundamental point we mustn't lose sight of. Roughly 2,500 companies today in both France and Germany are set up in respective countries. And together we employ 640,000 people in both our countries with those cross-border enterprises. And these figures are quite astounding. New figures we have, and these are new figures that we learnt, in fact, just this morning. I was listening to Mr. Tsonga quite closely, and he said something along the lines of, we, a good government is a government that implements a policy, a framework policy that enables the economy and enterprises to succeed. So if I could just focus on that, and I apply that to France and Germany, I would say that it has been a success. Last year, Germany became the first direct foreign investor in France in terms of just overall number of projects. The US probably beat us in terms of actual money, but in terms of number of projects in which we invest, Germany is the leader. And why is that good? Because it shows that despite globalization, despite what uh, Germany has been doing with China, South America and North America, France has been able to ensure that it is still an attractive country for Germany. And I would just like to come back to what has been done ever since 2017 with the French government. They've been considerably making France more attractive for foreign direct investment for Germany. Now, why are you attractive? It's because you're competitive and people want to invest in your country. And ultimately, that will help reduce the trade deficit that France had along with the rest of the world. So German investment in France actually contributes to ultimately reducing the trade deficit in France. 
To give you a few specific examples, more than 300 projects created 8,000 jobs in France last year, which is twice more than the previous year. So we're not just talking about investment projects uh, like uh, projects to sell German products in France, but no, we're talking about projects where there are partnerships with factories, research centers, uh, and workers. Uh, so we're talking about concrete investments in France. So uh, let me give you three or four examples because you brought up something very important, which is uh, the, the local uh, level, how can, which we've been talking about today. How can you uh, benefit from this? Most uh, in German investments that are made are not uh, made in Paris, but rather in uh, the provinces. So we have one company that expanded uh, its uh, implantation in Alsace, in the Alsatian region, for more than 300,000 uh, euros. Uh, we have one company that uh, in, opened uh, a mask uh, produce, production facility in uh, southern France, 90% of which are uh, exported, uh, and also another uh, medical center of expertise, and not far from here in Le Mans, class. Uh, bought out Renault's uh, tractor making uh, division a few years ago, and it's a family run business. And they decided to base all of the company's tractor making uh, research facility in France, and its um, flagship factory will be in Le Mans. And that means that a lot, uh, a majority of the production coming out of that plant will be exported. So all of these are just little examples to show you how the Franco-German relationship is strong, uh, not just economically, but in other ways as well. We see that investments uh, have the advantage, which is once a company has decided to invest, uh, you can, so 300 million euro investments are not done uh, in one fell swoop. They are long-term investments that are made over time. And so that gives you an idea of what's going to happen in the future, because Despite the crisis, I don't think that uh, they're going to renege on these investments because once they've been, uh, with, you know, they've committed to them and they're going to see them through. So when we talk about the Franco-German partnership in the constant context of Europe, we see that with Brexit, now that the UK has withdrawn from the EU, France and Germany together represent 40% of Europe's GDP, which you can, if you do the math, you can see that economically, uh, partnership between us makes sense and is very important and is even more important now. I wanted to remind you of that fact because we talk you know, about how Europe, European bureaucracy is kind of slow. Um, but keep in mind that uh, Germany and France are behind next generation EU, which has gathered 750 billion euros in investment over the next few years to get both of our countries and our all of the communities uh, to help them meet the challenges of the future, especially in terms of the green transition. So the last points in terms of Europe, we see many uh, technological partnerships. We've already talked about them, not just in terms of, uh, in the field of aviation, but also in, in AI, electric batteries just to name a few. These partnerships between our two countries have involved other partners in Europe as well. 
très bonne situation so actuellement. I really think that we can say that this our health our relationship is healthy and we have uh, the future in front of us is bright. So maybe a few final words about China and the United States. I talked about the volume 164 billion which makes France Germany's fourth biggest partner, first 245 billion euros is China, followed by 204 billion with the Netherlands. Uh, there's a lot of um, imported gas. And third place, we have the United States with 194 billion euros in 2001. So yes, these are huge figures. You see that China uh, is by far the biggest partner. But if you dig deeper, you will see that the volume of Germany's export towards China is uh, more than uh, more than 104 billion euros, but France uh, exported uh, 102 billion. So, Pologne, Slovakia, the Czechia, and the Hungary. Now, if we talk about the four smallest countries of Poland, Slovakia, Czech Republic, and Hungary, they're exporting, they export more than double. Uh, so China, which has uh, uh, a population in the billions, we do 100 billion in terms of exports, but with these four smaller countries, we have almost two, uh, two times the volume, which means that the worldwide market is important for Germany, yes, but Keep in mind that Germany still exports more, most, uh, about 70% of Germany's exports stay in Europe. So Europe will always be a very important trading partner uh, for Germany. And to conclude, if Germany as an exporting nation wants to alter its mandate, changing the uh, supply chain will not be a solution, will not help Germany and its European partners. But instead, having uh, trade agreements and partnerships with countries that share the same values and objectives is, in my opinion, the best solution for our two nations and European partners. A close partnership between our two nations is one of the keys that will help us achieve our, achieve our objectives. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Mr. Brandmeier, for respecting the time which was allotted to you and also for talking about the importance of the Franco-German partnership. Because, yes, you remind us of what the, that, that Germany is in a position of strength, and that's important. Now, we're going to pass the mic to Catherine Lubitschinsky, who is an economist she is going to talk about the European strategy uh, of having an economic powerhouse is now now is uh, facing coming up against uh, other economic powerhouses such as the BRIC countries. Brazil, Russia, India, China and South Africa is a group that initially was kind of a political grouping of countries, but now uh, is becoming uh, an economic uh, unit. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you to the Foundation for uh, inviting me. Uh, it was 
à une réunion du cercle des économistes où il nous avait was, when Mr. Raffarin, de, the leader, uh, your leader here was uh, prime minister, he came to one of our economists uh, meetings and so it was the least I could do to respond in kind to his invitation here today. The title of this round table is uh, economic uh, disruptions is this Asia's uh, century. I actually would prefer to focus on the BRICS country and want to re place Europe in a different context, a context in which we need to find answers and solutions as a group. We have the United States. Uh, Europe and BRICS countries. BRICS represent 25% or one quarter of the world's, world's GDP. BRICS produce one third of the world's food products and in the last 10 years have gained in importance. BRICS also uh, are banding together to, as a counterweight to the G7 countries. And they're doing this in a context of, um, of a situation where sovereignty really is losing its meaning. It's hard to define this, we could say instead of uh, sovereignty, we could say strategic autonomy, but for the economic world, the technological field, for the healthcare field, energy, for all of these fields, sovereignty hides or, or ignores the financial, the importance of the financial aspects. The financial aspect is essential, which is what I'm going to talk about. Why? Because finance is a considerable weapon when it is wielded, and I'm not the only one who says this. If you want to read the book that if you read Max Weber's uh, very interesting seminal work published in 1814, he says the same thing, which is prescient indeed. So it can be a weapon of mass destruction. We saw the uh, result of that in 2007, 2008, but also the, the fact that economics goes beyond borders, sanctions, the sanctions that uh, the United States have uh, taken out against, uh, that the United States have taken out against some European countries such as the NP. Uh, uh, initially, the sanction against BNP was uh, 9 billion euros, and thanks to uh, big negotiations at the highest level, brought down the sanctions to 6.6. But we also see this with the different sanctions that were uh, set uh, at the beginning, at the onset of the uh, war in Ukraine. There are different types of sanctions. What we don't know yet is if they are actually effective. So let me talk about the effectiveness of financial sanctions, which require a minimum amount of international cooperation, but they also require economic power and weight behind them to truly be effective. So this begs the question, how can we get strategic financial strategic autonomy and this is a very important question because if we connect 
The BRICS summit report from June 22, we see that there are several points that uh, reveal uh, concern about what they call the de-dollarization of the world's economy, i.e. reducing the world's dependency on the almighty dollar, and also Western payment structures. I'll talk, get into this a little bit later. And all of this talks about the monetary and financial uh, weight that uh, of these American sanctions and uh, but their international impact. So the first condition that is absolutely necessary is you need to have an economic powerhouse. And that's when you start to understand the importance of, of having uh, economic uh, alliances. So the United States is a huge power unto itself, but um, the BRICS countries put together are uh, definitely uh, a considerable uh, size, which is all the more reason for the European Union to band together and work uh, together as a group. And the group Alors, needs to be um, solid in Europe. It is necessary, but unfortunately, it's not enough. What else do we need? Number one, you need to have an international currency, meaning a currency that is used in international trade and that can be used uh, as a, a reserve, either with, uh, in terms of uh, bonds, or for trade. We know that uh, Russia's, uh, the majority of Russia's reserves are in dollars, 60% of China's reserves are in dollars, which is huge. So there's no surprise there. Uh, the dollar's omnipotence is, uh, is unquestionable. There are, yes, we have euros, euros, but there are three times more uh, transactions made with dollars than with euros. Uh, unfortunately, the sovereign debt crisis in uh, the eurozone in 2011 uh, questioned the uh, the un recul dans certains domaines the long the the euro's ability to last in the long term but we also have the renminbi which is bit by bit emerging and i would say quickly also because when we see our triennial, re triennial reports of the World Bank, we see still that renminbi was not really used internationally. But I think that uh, when the next report comes out uh, in the um, in the winter 2022-2023, uh, we will see that the renminbi is going to advance the yen, uh, and we see that there's a lot of competition in international currencies. Uh, apparently, I have two more minutes. So second point, you need to be able to uh, have access to savings. So when we talk about savings, we have uh, the famous uh, triptych. Uh, but in outside of Europe, a lot of uh, markets are very fragmented, and for that, it would we there isn't a partnership. We see that there is an unhealthy um, rivalry between uh, the Bourse and the Deutsche Bourse, uh, and that needs to be handled because it really is uh, has a negative impact, and the Chinese know this because they are uh, calling back uh, bringing back their market listing more and more 
because they understand that those markets depend on their own financing and not foreign financing. And the third point, one more point about infrastructure. So we don't talk about infrastructures as much. It's very technical. That's all the ins and outs of the financial system but they are crucial, critical institutions for a financial system. So we have international payment systems, compensation camp, uh, fields. For instance, we have LCH in Paris, which is 1 billion euros that is compensated for, which is huge. And we also have the central depositories. And there again, we see European individualism. In the US, we have one body that has all, which is the DTCC, um, is a one-stop shop, if you will, but we have more than 20 for each institution, and this also highlights the fragmentation and isolates, further isolates Europe in the uh, financial uh, markets, and in the meantime, BRICS countries are getting more organized. Uh, they're dealing with their uh, infrastructure. The Chinese have their own system, as do the Russians, and they're going to try to band together and serve as a counterweight to Europe. The last point is that when we have a certain financial strategic autonomy, we need to save it in an ever, competitive, ever more competitive world, in a world in which technology makes things go very, very fast. And in that world, we see that central banks are trying to come up with their own digital currency and the ECB is quite in advance on this. The Fed uh, joined the race a little bit later but uh, has, is playing catch up as they usually do and uh, we see that the BRICS uh, are following as well. Jean-Pierre is giving me, is rolling his eyes at me so that means I have to stop. So to conclude, I would like to conclude with uh, a beacon of hope for the Europe. So my uh, colleague mentioned that the Franco-German uh, alliance was strong, and I'd like to say that financially this should happen, but we need to keep an eye out for a potential risk in Italy. And the final point, I had a lot of hope when Laurence Boom uh, was no, uh, nominated to uh, uh, his European post because he is extremely knowledgeable about uh, the European financial markets. So that is another reason to hope for the future of Europe in the uh, three-pronged uh, partnership between uh, North America, Europe, and the BRICS. Thank you, Catherine. I'm so glad that you uh, showed us the importance of uh, the BRICS, because uh, 10 years ago I was at uh, the first summit on the BRICS at, at the annual forum, at the BOA forum, where the Chinese had in invited the various partners and I came back and I wrote I, I sent a mess memo to the Commission the Foreign Affairs Commission and the president said oh don't worry about it as Russian strategies don't work the Chinese and the Indians will never be able to work together but in fact we look when the Western world attacks uh, uh, Russia, uh, the Russia turns to the BRICS. When the, the West attacks Bolsonaro, the, he looks to the BRICS, etc. And so there is a solidarity in the in the face of difficulty. And so progressively, there is a political will that is being constructed, and that we do have to take it seriously. And when when they drink to the poor health of the, the G7 countries, we need to take that very much seriously. Now, let's continue talking about uh, and with the BRICS. We have Sumit Anan, and with his thought process, he is Franco-Indian, and he's worked for French French organizations, and he's, he's familiar with both sides of the, the, the coin here. 
India is a fantastic country. They are a democracy, but they also work with uh, Russia. They are in Asia, but they're also with us in the Indian Pacific, Pacific region. They are a, a rising power. Um, that we can't really get grasp a grasp on, but they do carry their weight. And when uh, when we vote at the UN on whether we should be imposing sanctions on Russia, uh, India, India abstains, and India plus China represents a huge proportion of the world's population. So you can see that India, which is a complex country, which maybe makes it a little bit fragile. In fact, it's in a strategic position currently because uh, there's a tension with Ru with China, but uh, they're close to Russia, and this gives India a very important place on the the uh, international stage. So, what are you, what can you tell us about this? Thank you, Mr. Prime Minister. I'm going to try to answer these uh, political questions. Uh, I'm also an industrial <laughs> actor, um, uh, as uh, bonjour, Denis was saying bonjour, earlier. Uh, Good afternoon, Madame everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Mr. Prime uh, Minister. Good afternoon to the Michon. president Michon. of the of the uh, um, Department Continental Council. I'm so very glad to be with you today. Thank you for having invited me, and thank you to the uh, the Foundation Perspective and Innovation for having the in, uh, extended this invitation. Let me introduce myself a little bit. I am Indian, but I had the pleasure of uh, discovering Europe very early in my in my life, and I went to Germany to do an internship, and I from there I discovered France, and I came to France to study at HSC, and I decided to work for some French groups in India. So I, I lived near uh, Cognac, in the Cognac region in, in Angoulême, and I, I visited the Futuroscope in 1994, and I went back to India as a director general of two French groups in India, and then I created a, a, a group called Insight Growth Partners. India is always uh, seen as an exotic country, very complicated, but in fact it is a, a, a terrain of unity, and it's a, my honor to preside at, uh, over the uh, French Indian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. So that's who I am, and I'm here to talk to you today about India, and I'm very pleased to be here. India is a country where there are so many things happening. Uh, there's a, a, the in development is being updated constantly. But first, let me start with the question. Are we in a, an, in a, in a, is this an Asian century? Well, my question is, my answer is definitely yes, but, but it's not starting now because we started with Japan 50 years ago and then, and then China and then India. So this century, Asian century is ongoing, which is understandable because up until 1820, the revolu industrial revolution, um, the Asian economies in China and India were superior to the rest of the world, including Europe. So it's completely understandable, normal, that uh, Asia uh, regains an important role in the economy. Different uh, countries have uh, progressed uh, according to their own rhythms, and, and uh, now when we talk about an Asian century, that seems just logical. So, that said, we can't group everyone in, in together in Asia. Japan and South Korea are, are, are very advanced countries, and then China where the GDP per capita is, is much lower than in Europe, and then we have uh, countries like India, Bangladesh, uh, where the GDP is uh, 10 to 20 times inferior to that in France. So there's a lot still to be done in Europe, and there are a lot of different models to, to, to in China. 
Until recently, we talked about the Chinese century, but China and Asia is not the same thing. There is a Chinese model, there's a Japanese model, a Malaysian model, the Indian model, and the Chinese model in itself has uh, evolved. And uh, we're talking about India now because there are different contexts and different models in in, in Asia and in India. My second point is that we, we can't group all of the countries in Asia together. Each country is different. We have to look at each country, its model, its history, its culture, its inspiration. And it, if we talk about India specifically, I think that in this world, this disrupted world, where Europe needs to develop and be, be as strong as possible, Europe has to find partners with whom they can develop. Um, and take advantage of their technological ad, ad, uh, advances and things. And I believe that India is that partner. Why India? Well, maybe I could start by telling you a little bit about India today. I've listed a few main points here, and then I'll come, go, move on to the traditional criticisms of India. First, four main points. The Indian economy is already the number Five, the fifth economy in the world, bigger than the French economy, and it's going to triple in the next 10 years. That's the first point. Second point is that India has the largest youth population with 800 million young people under the age of 35. Third, India vaccinated 940 million people with a with the AstraZeneca vaccine. Annual GDP growth in the, in the past 10 years, of those 10 years, five of those years, uh, the Indian growth was greater than that in China. And in the next few years, it will be every year higher, higher than the Chinese growth rate by at least 1.7 points. And we have uh, 50 billion euros have been invested in, in India in foreign, uh, foreign uh, funds recently. But there are also some situations in India that are, that are disturbing to people. And let's take a look at those realities as, as, as well. First of all, India is a poor country. Yes, well, that's true. But we have... We've brought the rate of extreme poverty from 40 to 10 percent in the next 10, 10 years. We also say India is far away. It's, it's, it's exotic. It's very rich. It's diverse. It takes time to understand it. Um, India is not France. It's as diverse as Europe. And so you have to take time to understand it, just like you have to take time to understand Europe. In Europe, in India, we have a lang an English uh, national language, which is English, which is a European language. We have a multicultural society. We have the citizens who believe in democracy and in human values. And we are a country of debate and argumentation with people who are very open to the world. So in fact, India is far away, but actually when you're there, um, when people arrive in India, they think, oh, it's going to be difficult, it's good to get used to, it's going to be di very different. But in fact, people, people love it there because they say it's not that different. You can make friends. You you eat well. You you can eat, drink alcohol. You can you can travel. You can share all kinds of things. India is what we call a chaotic democracy. Yes, but it is a well-founded democracy. A, a state of a law. Our government currently. Um, has uh, uh, followed on uh, 30 years of coalition. 
India is complicated for business, sort of, but not less and less. Uh, India has gone from 111 to 63 in ranking in business by the World Bank. In India has partners with businesses that are and businesses that were that were trained in in the Western world. So there are solutions. India is a protectionist country. Well, not really. The average rate of protectionism is the same as in the U.S. We have a free trade agreement with the EU. The renegotiated to include agricultural project, uh, products. The India is, has a more and more aggressive approach to commerce, but has a, an equitable, a, a fair trade approach to, to commerce as well. We've accumulated 400 billion euros of investment in the past 10 years. So India is open to the world and not projectionist. India is geopolitically unaligned. This is not true anymore, in my opinion. Historically, we were not non-aligned. We were, we're close. Historically, we're, we're closer to England, also to um, the USSR and Russia, militarily speaking. But currently, we have good relations with the Western world, with the United States, with Europe, with France. Uh, we have a strategic partnership with uh, France, with Japan, with Israel, with the Islamic countries, where very often, uh, we, traditionally, everyone said, well, Pakistan will be, be in relation with the, those countries, uh, the, uh, Saudi Arabia and those And unfortunately, relations with China is, are, are a little bit more tense right now, but India has shown the importance of uh, participation in the international and the Western world. We often say that India does not want to take its responsibilities in regards to climate change. This is false. India is engaged in the fight against climate change. And we have a target to, uh, for regarding renewable energy. Of course, there are tensions with our with our neighbors, but India wants peace for the world. All of this comes comes down to the fact that India is a new country and a country with which Europe should associate. It's a country that it can be a good partner partner uh, a partner for bipolar relations a partner for low-cost services, a partner with whom Europe has uh, developed investment and trade. And that's why India is no longer a long-term potential country. It's a country where, where for the short and the mid-term, India's mark size, it's uh, its talent, its supply chain and manufacturing are all considerable. Uh, we have a lot of Indian, uh, of French investment and in French companies in in India. Schneider Electric's uh, number three client is India. Total Energy has invested 3.5 billion euros in India in hydrogen, nitrogen, and renewable energy. And I could go on with examples like this. Pernod Ricard, number the third market, L'Oréal, many others. Aeroport de Paris is invested in the, at the airport in New Delhi. So there are lots of examples like this, lots of European and French companies who realize that, that, that India is a land of opportunity. And uh, we represent opportunity between France and India and Europe and e India for this Asian century. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.
for explaining the new role of India. And you did notice that between two, between the lines, uh, he said Asia's presence is going to be long term. And there was first China and then Japan. Sorry, first Japan, then China, now India. So the importance of Asia is here to stay. And one question before we move on. Uh, Denis Ronk, do you think that the French government and the European authorities should decide that we have to uh, work mostly with the United States, China, India? How do we attack that issue in terms of uh, European governance? Should we should we be, be wary of certain markets? Should, should we sanction Brazil because uh, they don't no longer share our values? How can we guarantee coherence between economic action? Because you, you mentioned a certain number of uh, French groups that have a, a very major presence in India and they, uh, they play a very important role in France. Should we let those companies just uh, make their own decisions in terms of their own strategy or should we try to structure some sort of development reflection uh, linked to our political reflection? Well, that's a very complex question and I'm not uh, in the position to give lessons uh, to anyone, particularly the French government, but I think we have to think about the balance between um, between a world in which Europe has to be more self-sufficient, um, but we're not just going to suddenly get rid of the advantages of sharing values and, and marginal yields. So I think that we do live in an international world and that's true even though we don't talk about sovereignty. Between the different blo economic blocks, well, I think that it's uh, Europe's role to, to play on the balance between them. Airbus, for example, um, has uh, tried to take advantage of uh, the situation in China where when Trump moved away from China, China, Buick is another example. So this, the Airbus strategy in China is very simple. They manufacture in China because uh, we have to give a Chinese look to our, our planes, but we also have to be careful what we transfer. These planes do remain European planes. But, uh, I think that uh, we, we need to play the, the, car, the balance card. That's very important. The president of the Association of French Major Companies said that the, French, uh, the Indian, Chinese, American markets are the only are, are mandatory for any French country and French company that wants to be wants to claim to be an international company. And so we have to be sure that there are no economic consequences that could be penalizing, penalize, represent a penalty for our companies. So thank you very much for your participation on this roundtable on the economic changes and this question on, regarding the Asian century. We're going to move now on to the third table round table and I'd like to invite Joachim Peterlich and you're right yes we should can give them a round of applause. Joachim Peterlich is the former ambassador and a former dim diplomatic advisor to Chancellor Helmut Kohl. So he knows quite a lot about European issues and Franco-German relations. Also, Pascal Boniface, director of IRIS, and we have Janos Martoni, and Janos Martoni, the former Minister of Foreign Affairs in Hungary, is online with us. Yes, he is online with us. Mr. Minister, it's a, a a pleasure to have our Hungarian friend with us for this roundtable. 
to help us uh, uh, go through this geopolitical an analysis. We've looked at uh, uh, um, economic change and, uh, um, and political change. Now, what about the geopolitical changes? How can we look find an outlook for cooperation so that cooperation um, actually um, uh, prevails rather than rivalries, uh, which are, have been appearing over and over. And I'm going to let Pascal um, Boniface, Director of IRIS, uh, to take the, pleasure, the floor first. Uh, we do appreciate him being here with us, not only because uh, he is so knowledgeable as a political uh, uh, expert, but also as a teacher, as a professor, he has a way of uh, explaining things so that we can understand, and that's very useful to be understood. So, over to you, dear Pascal. Thank you. And how long do I have? Six, 12 is okay, 15, we'll see. Any later, we'll cut your microphone. Right. Well, thank you very much. It's always a pleasure to be here. And it's always a way of opening up the new year of thought that comes. Whenever we come to the Futuroscope, it is the first main intellectual debate that we have for the new year. We've just come out of the summer break. We've had a chance to think and ruminate on a number of topics and we can come back ready for the new year with this as our first event for the year and it's really quite an exciting intellectual event it is my sixth year now it's always a joy to be back and it's always a pleasure to be invited now when talking about geopolitics there's very rarely any good news to share it tends to be a lot of bad news and what we see is that in the very near future, things are going to get worse when we look at uh, what's happening in Europe. This is not the first time that we've had uh, a war since the Second World War. We had Kosovo, and on 24th of February this year, we saw a number of countries take a number of irreconcilable positions. So there's no compromise possible between the two. We have Zelensky on one side saying that we can only have peace when Ukraine will be able to get back the territory going back to 2014, so even pre-Crimea. And uh, Russia, well, they, they ran a bid, they wanted to take over Ukraine in a clean fell swoop, but they didn't succeed on doing that. So now we are in the current situation and they said that uh, uh, they told the Russian people that the Ukrainian people were going to welcome the Russian troops with open arms and it was based on false information that they were telling the Russian people this. But that's what he was gambling on. And very quickly, Russia faced national resistance coming from Ukraine because the nation is still much stronger than whatever rhetoric you can try and pander from outside those borders. So what we see is that we now have a situation where no ceasefire is possible, therefore there's no peace. So two outcomes, either war will continue, protracted war, covered by the media quite a lot, or things will ramp up and escalate and that is one of the current fears so the past six months war has been being waged in the region and we don't know exactly when it will end and there is always the uh, nuclear threat be it on civil installations with the nuclear power plants or even nuclear warheads they are always hanging over everyone's head so when talking about this war that there appears to be more losers than there are winners in the equation. So we need to look at the geostrategic consequences of this. So the first and foremost, the main loser of this war is Russia. Had we convened on the 24th of February, I would have said there is no going to be no war. All Russian specialists back in the day, former foreign ministers, former prime ministers, French ambassadors in Moscow, back on the 23rd of February, they didn't think that war was imminent. 
because they said it was goes against Russian interests. And what they have always seen in Putin's behavior is that Putin always seeks to defend Russian interests above all else. And Putin's mantra has always been, look where Russia was when I took over power, and now look where it is. But on the 24th of February, while Russia had constantly gaining more power on the Russian, on the global stage, ever since the 90s, ever since Yeltsin, well, that all changed in February. The current policy that Russia is carrying out is going to have short-term effects, mid-term effects, negative fallout on the country. And it is going to have a huge impact. But on top of that, there's going to be the brain drain. All of these intelligent people, trained people, who are being squashed by the current regime. So some people, they may want to stay, but they aren't going to speak up. University professors, they may be, cons they may be uh, targeted by the political forces in power if they speak out, even just slightly against the regime. Now, the only way you can talk about the situation in Russia is by a special military operation. They can't even use the word war. And there's that fear, intellectual fear in Russian. So those people who are fearful of this situation, they are fleeing elsewhere. And that is a brain drain that Russia is going to suffer. And then on top of that, and on top of that, there is a major deficit when it comes to technology as well that is going to be exacerbated in the future. So in the long term, Russia is going to be deeply impeded. Is this a new Cold War? Well, this is no Cold War because there is an actual war being waged. And I don't think we need to go back as far as Brezhnev or Gorbachev. We need to go back to Stalin to see a point in history where there was such little communication, such so few relations between Russia and the West. Scientific, cultural, artistic, economic relations. Now, we're not going to uh, ban uh, Dostoevsky, but uh, there are some people saying that that's going to happen. There's an example in Italy. And under Khrushchev, even under Khrushchev, there were closer relations. And the thing is, deep down, Russians are pro-European because they are from the European continent. But in positioning themselves against the West, that is part of a global chessboard, a global checkerboard. And far too Far too often, the West and Westerners tend to conflate global relations and Western relations and Western desires. If you look at the number of countries that took out sanctions against Russia, there are only us, only Western countries. Those countries who, strategically speaking, are part of the West. So obviously you have also Australia and New Zealand, but the rest of the world, they didn't follow suit. And the great danger here is that it will be once again the West against the rest, with non-Western countries not no longer following us and no longer following suit. And simply because, well, they aren't the ones waging war, so they don't need to take out sanctions. Or you have, for example, Russian athletes being excluded from... Uh, Russian athletes being excluded from sporting events. But then also you have some Western countries saying, well, we actually do have vested interest in Russia. So you're, I mean, you, the West, so you're talking about a value and what have you, and you don't want to invest in the country. But just look at when Biden went out to Riyadh. He wanted to make EMBS a pariah because of uh, human rights. But when it comes to the oil market, he said, it's very hard to plead for, on one side, human rights, but then the other side plead for more oil. So it's always a balancing act that people are playing. And many countries, they don't want to follow suit simply because they have other vested interests. And now when we're talking about the Cold War, it's not a Cold War, once again. Back in the time of the Cold War, countries had to pick between one side or the other. Nowadays, it's the opposite. Countries no longer want to choose. They want to have relations with us and with Russia. 
And we, if, if we continue to insist on the fact that people need to cut ties with Russia, then they're not necessarily going to choose our side. They're not going to choose the West. And we need to take heed of that. Now, Ukraine, it's a country, it's suffering, it's being martyrized. There are war crimes, we've seen war crimes being committed there, and at the same time. And now I'm being very clinical and quite cynical here when I say this. Ukraine has now taken on a status that they didn't have before. Ukraine will be rebuilt because money is coming. And then everyone will, everything that was said up until the 23rd of February will be forgotten when they were refusing to apply the Minsk agreement. And now Ukraine has acquired the status of candidate for to join the European Union, and that's changing quite a lot. I remember Zelensky once said that without Ukraine, Russia cannot be an empire. Now we, now we could ask the same question, Europe without Ukraine, will it, will it be a superpower? Will it be a global power in the future? A lot has changed since 2011 to 2021. And I think, unfortunately, far too often emotion supersedes reason. And we will need to provide financial interest, but we need to see where our interests lie in the long term. And we may not have to, we may have to not accept Ukraine joining the European Union because Europe has suffered in the past for from expanding its borders too fast, too soon. Now, in Europe, the main losers are France and Germany. Macron said back in 2019, November, that NATO was brain dead. And nowadays, it is part of Europe's strategy for further autonomy. And when we look at uh, uh, France, uh, France uh, trying to reach out to Russia for certain strategic reasons, we can no longer do that. Because now, France and Germany are being accused because we've been trying to negotiate with the Russia. Was it Russia that waged war? Or is it rather because we didn't listen to all those people who were raising the alarm bells? Think about back into 1991 with Mitterrand, former ambassador, US ambassador of the time, based out in Moscow. And then in 2008 as well, Nicolas Sarkozy, Angela Merkel, they said, no, Ukraine will not join NATO. Are we not paying for that decision now? Well, uh, whatever the case was back in the day, Ukraine didn't join NATO. So the burden of proof is, uh, is it on their side or on our side? So within the European Union, the Baltic states and Poland, they are the ones leading the dance. And we are facing criticism for our relationships in the past with Russia. And the other, the other loser of this, the United States, think of what happened in Kabul. When talking about European, we want to increase military spending, but in, in doing that, we're actually going to be buying that from the United States. So actually, I misspoke a little earlier, they're going to be the winners. But here, when talking about what's happening here is the true military threat and threat is only being felt by Ukraine. It's not going to be felt by Europe directly. So we gave in to panic in increasing our defense budget, in increasing and extending the Europe of defense. Now, if Biden had not said so much uh, in terms of all of the uh, military support, then maybe Putin, they would not have, he would not have acted as such. But think about what happened in Korea. Korea was a different uh, story because they, they saw it as being a green light from Stalin and Mao. And they said that whatever is going to happen, there won't be any military retaliation, but that's a different story. Now what we're seeing, what we're seeing now is that Biden's project, which preceded the war in Ukraine, he said, we need to create a coalition, democratic countries against authoritarian nations, against China and Russia. And we committed the same mistakes in the past. If we see them as an enemy, they will become an enemy. 
Obviously, Russia and China are very different. They aren't enemies. And it's not in presenting these countries as an enemy, in trying to create an anti-China bloc. And we're not going to appease this international stage. We need to be very clear-sighted on that. So it is high time that Europe takes full autonomy in terms of its own strategy. And I think in the very near future, well, it's too late. We're going to need to wait some time before we'll be able to have our own true strategic autonomy. We're going to have to continue to tackle these headwinds and push forward. Maybe it will be through a Franco-German alliance, because if we don't have a Franco-German alliance, then we won't be able to get there. We have German, German governments, uh, uh, French governments, which are uh, a little weaker than in the past, especially in terms of domestic policy. So for the time being, that needs to be shored up before we can turn our gaze further afield. So we need to avoid the trap of saying that uh, European European strategic autonomy is, is just suffering, it's agonizing, it's not brain dead yet, it is agonizing, but we also need to say that we are no longer the center of the world, the western world is no longer the center of the world, there is the rest of the world. We spoke of the BRICS countries a little earlier, and if we feel that the current time is different, we alone can no longer dictate the rules, we can no longer set the global agenda. It may have existed in the past, but if we don't move on from that, then we're going to just aggravate the situation. It's not our values that are being contested, it's the hypocrisy that we are upholding. It's the inconsistency when we're trying to apply our own values, because if we don't uphold our own values, then we're not going to be respected for that. And the others sitting around the table, if they are just going to be relegated to a backseat position, then people are going to want to come to the negotiation table. And many people around the world are being much more realistic about the situation than we are. And I would just like to finish by saying there is worse than political re reality, and that's political, political falsehoods. Well, thank you very much for that. Now, what we can see is that peace will not come just like that. Peace, like war, it it is a strong decision. And what we can see is that currently people aren't necessarily working for peace, but they're working for war and we need to work towards peace. We need to put in place dialogue. We need to point out strategic issues between our countries. And remember, war, war doesn't come from strategic issues, but from just misunderstanding. When we look at what happened in Taiwan, well, you know, it may just be a tiny mistake, it may just be um, someone stepping out of line just here or there, but it may be just a miscommunication that could trigger a war, not a matter of strategy. So therefore, peace, like war, it requires a peace in particular, it requires a lot of thought and conversation. Because war is something that happens completely, is completely abstract from that entire process. Moving now on to Joachim, Joachim Bitterlich. You held a number of quite high positions in Germany and your view of Europe and the threats that we've been speaking about a little earlier, the war in Ukraine, the United States, China, economic hardships the political illegality that we're seeing in a number of countries within Europe. How can we talk about a European future, a European fate that is taken outside of its own history? I'm very honored to be here. Uh, the last time I here was on June 13th, 1997 for the 69th Franco-German Summit, so 25 years ago. I haven't been back since. At the time, there was uh, the, it was the government of Chirac 
uh, who was of one party, and um, uh, Jospin of the Socialist Party. So it's what we call in France a cohabitation of two leaders of two parties. Uh, indeed, says Raffarin. But now I really don't have too much to add except to say that uh, my colleague maybe was a little bit critical. In 2008, I myself was uh, shocked when George W. Bush at the time pushed uh, for the Ukraine to join the NATO. And at the time, you know, I've been to Kiev uh, a dozen times in the 1990s, and I was of the firm belief that the peace should stay as neutral as possible. And the most we could do is to create a bridge between what we said called then the East and the West. And that's what we thought at the time. That's what we chose at the time. And at the conclusion of that summit, to the surprise of, of most other people who were there in the room. Most people, uh, at the most people expected a, a program for Ukraine, but we didn't think that they would uh, postpone uh, their, their adhesion. I, for my part, listened to Pascal with a little bit of bitterness because I've know a lot about both France and Germany, and I have predicted this war as far back as 2017, and I heard that the French ambassador and the German ambassador in Moscow in 2019 did not take the Kremlin's clear uh, threats seriously. At the time, I said that a solution could be uh, to give uh, Crimea a particular status, to give confer the Ukraine a unique status, um, or maybe to have an association with the EU and uh, the uh, Eastern Bloc, or the, 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 the economic bloc countries that uh, used, made up the former Soviet Union. But, Pascal, you'll remember that in the second half of the summit of the 90s, we, try, we relaunched the debate, but nothing happened. For me, it was clear after the uh, failure of Minsk in 2015, the French and Germans should be on their guard. And today, I agree with the analysis that was made. Uh, they are very afraid of a second Cold War that I described in uh, an American, uh, in a book published in the United States in three years ago. But they have gone through years of armed conflict and hardship, and this is going to have a very adverse impact on our economies. And so, Mr. Prime Minister, I'm going to change your question into what can we do? What can we do for Europe? And for me, the key issue is how can we guarantee, or as the British call self-assertion, uh, of our European political and economic model. And whether we're in Paris or Berlin in the short term, or should we have what I call a medium to long term strategic way of thinking? What are the priorities that we should have? And so here are some ideas. Number one, we need to strengthen Europe. Uh, the Europe is in a bad state because we are, are really, what we're living here is an East-West conflict, and we need to find a way out of that. There are differences that are not going to be resolved through European courts. We have to come up with a political solution with countries to the East who are going through a transition phase. And it reminds me of how Germany Germany's denazification happened up to the 80s, and it was very difficult for them. There was a lot of unsafety, insecurity, sorry, 
uh, there was a meeting of we have to help them and then punish them. Uh, so I think we need to re rethink that. Uh, we need to rethink the European strategy, uh, both economic and in terms of uh, security. We need to rethink our uh, European research model. How can we catch up? with the Americans and the Chinese who are so far ahead of us. For instance, what's scary is that there are more than there are more than 60 American patents in this iPhone, but only one European patent uh, with all of our smartphones. Energy policy. Our, our different policies are basically incompatible. We've tried to come up with a common uh, policy for more than 30 years. Uh, we need to come up with what I, what I call a true European uh, energy network where we could exchange energy in, uh, in, in a matter of seconds. And to be honest, in Parliament, I know, uh, European Parliament, I only know one person who's an expert in the matter and very few in Paris know anything about it. This could represent uh, an economy of 10 to 15 percent of our economy. Why can't we come up with this historic compromise around an energy policy? The Europe, uh, excuse me, Europe finds itself in an embarrassing situation. We can't be uh, halfway between Europe and the United States. We need to be realistic, and that means that on the one hand, we need to rethink the transatlantic alliance, both in terms of defense and in terms of uh, trade and politics. We need to come up with a new transatlantic charter. We This is a, a narrow window. Maybe with Biden, we could uh, achieve this type of change. Secondly, we need to develop our European defenses. But let's be realistic. This morning, we heard someone say that this would only be possible if we up, uh, have a strong European pillar at NATO and at the same time, European autonomy. And I heard that the Versailles summit uh, came up with uh, uh, a roadmap for that. And to be honest, that's laughable. To do that, we need to really work uh, on this subject for the years to come, not just in terms of armament, but also in terms of how we train our troops, how we use troops and armies differently. Obviously, we need to rethink our relationship with Asia. China is a, a competitive, uh, is, is a competitor and a rival, yes. But that doesn't mean that we should uh, break all ties with China. No, we should speak with them openly and have uh, try to foster a healthy relationship and be careful that we don't see a progressive uh, deterioration of the relationship between the United States and China. Somebody talked about uh, a, a strong partnership. It needs uh, the next challenge, which is Africa. We are have seen firsthand that uh, in Africa, excuse me, in Europe, in France, in Germany, we see that Africa is falling behind. And we really, truly need to think about how we can change our relationship with Africa, where, which is a continent where Russia and China are advancing, but we aren't. We need to come up with ways to cooperate with our neighboring continent. Somebody talked about multilateralism. Yes, uh, right now it's at a dead, uh, it's dead in, in the water. But maybe we can rethink a certain type of regionalism. Is that the only way forward? And my last point, the European Union and its neighbors. We are facing a huge challenge in terms of uh, European Union expansion. What should we do with the Balkan countries? 
Do we leave them? No, we need to come up together with a realistic plan to integrate them. And also, we need to think about what is our conception of European Union in the future? Do we have the willingness, do we have the possibility to develop an effective European Union in the years to come, a Europe that includes more than 30 members? To be quite honest, I'm not sure we can right now. Europe is being run as if it were a Europe of 12 to 15 members, but not a Europe of 27, and certainly not a Europe of 30 or more member nations. So we need to find a solution and, and something different. We need to discuss. And finally, we need to come, go back to what I call the, the arc that links Russia, Ukraine, Turkey, Middle East, North Africa. We came up with, back in, we were talking about our European uh, partnership strategy in the early 2000s. We talked about our, that we said we were surrounded by friends, but how things have changed. We can't exclude Russia from uh, our European circular circle. They are our big neighbors to the east. We have to think about Turkey. In 2007, I said that we wouldn't be able to agree on ratifying Turkey's adhesion requirements in Europe, but a market where we could uh, associate uh, work with Turkey in terms of trade and also policy and maybe go back to it in 25 years. But let's be realistic, it wasn't going to happen. North Africa, unfortunately, I'm sorry, but the Mediterranean and Europe policy has been, uh, has been, has had its hand tied for 25 years since the Barcelona summit. We've seen failure after failure with Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, Algeria, and soon uh, we see that Morocco is getting to be a problem as well. But it should be one of our priorities. And in all of this, Pascal, you're right. We need a Franco-German partnership as a foundation. But I must admit, I am worried by the real and actual state of that relationship. There's not enough substantive debate, there's not enough exchange, and I don't think that we should always look towards the past. So we only presented uh, conclusions with our bosses at the time if we agreed on uh, the substance. I know that we haven't managed, we haven't reached all of our goals in terms of foreign policy. We don't agree because of a certain reticence on both sides. <laughs> We also uh, failed in terms of uh, interior security, but I think the time is right for Europe to take that giant leap forward and handle its strategic priorities for the next four to five years. It's paramount. Thank you very much. Merci beaucoup, Joachim Bitterich. Parmi Thank you, Joachim. You brought up the East-West conflict within Europe itself. And since we have here with us uh, Janef Martini, who is our Hungarian minister, Janos 
What is your point of view about the situation within East-West situation within Europe? And also, what is your reflection on the European Union's uh, foreign policy? Can you hear me and can you take the floor? Yes, Prime Minister, I, we can hear each other. First of all, Thank you for inviting me. I'm so sorry I couldn't be there in person with you, but thanks to technology, I've been able to follow all of the discussions today. I heard a lot of very interesting, important points. From, from my point of view, I'd like to begin with a few brief words about the world in general and talking about geopolitical bre uh, breaches today. To summarize in one sentence, I think that we are no longer in a world of hypotheses and fear, threats, because now, today, all of those have become a reality. Uh, to put it simply, war has returned. Ten years ago, they said that uh, history has come back, but now war is back. Now a lot of people say that there is a new world order. I'm not sure about that. I would say that uh, we're going back to an old world order. Think about it. Things are changing, yes, but there is some continuity and things are staying, staying somewhat the same because of this war. It's true that there's a sort of polarization, fragmentation, uh, and two opposing sides, but there are a few clear things we can observe. Number one, no one has total domination in the world. There's no hegemony that reigns. We don't even know, see a clear hierarchy of powers. We see more a sort of heterarchy um, instead of a homogeneity. It's a type of order, but it uh, has a, a varying or evolving uh, ranking. If you look at population, and depending on what ranking you see, the ranking can be can vary. So we see that there's increased uh, insecurity. It's also a source of conflict and tension. So, what is the solution? Because that's uh, what we want to be. What we want to talk about today. I would like to underscore. That. This is nothing new. A lot of people have talked about it, but we don't just need a worldwide balance because I, I'm not going to talk about that. I don't have time, but instead I'm going to talk about a different type of balance and how that balance uh, in the North Atlantic Alliance, which we, we've already talked about. And in order to have that, we need a stronger European Union. I agree wholeheartedly with what Prime Minister Rafa, Prime Minister Raffarin said at a different seminar when he said that you can't have balance without strength. So strength 
is what's missing. Europe needs to be stronger. So how can we make Europe stronger? That is the key question that we should be asking. And it's true that we also need balance within the European Union. We need balance between France and Germany. Yes, we've already mentioned that. But we also have to have a balance between small and large countries, balance between North-South, between the spendthrift countries and more frugal countries, and also between East and West of the European Union. And when I say East, I mean more Central Europe, Central European countries. That has a, a unique uh, experience, um, and not just because, as former Soviet, uh, excuse me, communist countries, but also uh, their shared history over the last thousand years. Uh, Poland, Hungary, and other Central European countries. We also have to. Remember uh, our, our unusual pasts, but to renew, uh, overhaul and strengthen Europe, how can we strengthen those balances that I'm trying to talk about? We've talked about strength already, but when we talk about strength, uh, we always talk about uh, economic, uh, technological, military capacity. But I would suggest uh, that what's most important, the most important task before we have before us is to, to rediscover the soul of Europe. In other words, the immaterial strength, cultural strength, moral strength. If you like, we could even talk about spiritual force, uh, strength. That, I believe, is what will define the future of Europe. And for that, we need several, we need several things. First of all, we need respect for each other. Uh, we, need a, we need tolerance, respect for diversity, we, and we need diversity in, in itself, because Europe is also about diversity. And if we understand that, these are actually all immaterial things. People don't, some people don't like to talk about community identity, but actually the identity of Europe is one of the keys of our suggest. We have to find the balance between the national identity, which is very strong, generally stronger than the European identity among Europeans, but also we have to work on the European your uh, identity because recognizing our national identities does not mean that we want to exclude our European uh, identity. We have to have both, but to, in order to have both, we have to recognize and we have to accept others and we have to accept uh, histories and special trends. And most importantly, we have to in, avoid ideological traps. Ideology by nature is divisive. That is that that's the, the, the goal of ide ideology, the purpose. So we have to accept political differences, which are perfectly normal. But we need a separative line between ideology on the one hand and politics on the other. And then, of course, uh, there are other separations that are possible. For example, there are legal issues, there are political issues. If we mix the legal and the political, there can we can come across difficulties. But I believe that 
we need we need these divergences they are legitimate and they exist but they should not become forms of cleavage but at the same time cleavage should not become ruptures if we manage to establish or re-establish an equilibrium within Europe between the East and the West that's just one of the cleavages that exist today there are others as well but in any case if we manage to to find a solution for those problems then i believe i'm certain i'm absolutely convinced that we will find solutions better solutions for the major huge challenges that are facing us from the outside and one of the problems in i believe is that for decades we we were a little bit too absorbed by our own difficulties of course those difficulties do exist and they're valid but we mustn't well we shouldn't have forgotten the the role of international affairs and the international responsibilities and the responsibilities outside of our union and that's why we need strength and once again material stre strength but most importantly we need immaterial strength easier said than done but uh, we're here today to, to think about these questions and to put our heads together on all these issues and we're also here to try to understand each other and to understand each other much better than we have up until now i've always been an optimist and i will always remain an optimist despite the current situation uh, and that current situation is cause for much concern and many problems a lot of anguish and a lot of uh, <laughs> and all we can do is hope that someday uh, undoubtedly this tragic war will come to an end how and when we don't know but we as the european union must reinforce our unity within the european union but also in our alliance uh, with our transatlantic alliances Thank you very much, Mr. Minister. I would like to thank you, I would congratulate you on the quality of your French. We're very, very impressed by the, your fluid mastery of the French language. And we did understand your message on uh, the spiritual dimension on things and, and the importance of respect and mutual respect. But an idea came up, came through in, in what you were saying. You talked about external challenges, which force us to integrate external thought processes and external systems with which we must dialogue, have dialogue. And what's important for everyone is that within our European space, that we be very demanding in regards to our values and our commitments so that we are representative. Pascal Boniface talked about coherence, but when we talk about ex we talk when we talk when we talk about external values, but we have to also especially be uh, coherent on our internal values. Mr. Minister, what do you think of when it comes to human rights and uh, the rule of law and the, the basic fundamentals of uh, European um, construction when we are discussing things outside of the EU, we're talking to different partners who do not necessarily have the same system as ours. For ours, we are very demanding. Would you accept that? 
reasoning. Yes. Yes, I believe that when it comes to internal affairs, our vowel values are clear and they're they're very clear. And once again, I'd like to underline the fact that our differences, our divergencies, our, the, the debates that are underway in some circumstances between the Eastern and Western part of our union do not concern the values, our, our values themselves, that they, they concern facts. We see facts differently. But we also try to find solutions. Let's look at the example of Hungary. One of the budgetary conditions, the, a budgetary uh, pr procedure has been launched by the, the European Union. There are some intense negotiations underway, and it would seem that solutions uh, are in the process of being found based on our common values. That's for the interior, interior affairs. For external affairs, I would be a little bit more cautious. We've already said today that there are different models. There are different approaches. There are different ways of life, different ways of life to, to, be, to be polite about it. And we have to try to respect other ways of life, which are different from our own, which does not necessarily mean that I want to accept those other ways of life. In fact, personally, I've always been convinced that there are values which are, should be, are, and are universal and are the same everywhere. Maybe you have different approaches to the sources of those universal values, but for many of us, uh, the source uh, uh, is uh, simple. It's a question of uh, several thousands of years now. But once again, we need tolerance and we need a certain respect for others or we have to, but we, we do have to, we have to be able to take position. If there is a serious violation of international public law, we have to actually say that. I do say that. I, because I'm a legal expert, uh, this does not mean that the geopolitical uh, anal analyses are not complicated and nuanced, but there are certain facts which exist and should be clearly stated. Mr. Minister, thank you very much. That's very clear, and I would like to thank you for that, um, um, those specifications. Pascal, clearly we all agree that we need dialogue and debate. In today's society, are we really capable of organizing debate? Maybe, in fact, when it comes to these major issues, maybe we're continuously suspicious of each other and we no longer recognize convictions, we only look at interest, self-interest. And maybe the question is whether our democracies are able to debate whether something is a serious error. Um, but, and maybe, uh, for example, that Putin's actions are a serial error. But maybe we could all, should also recognize that it was our error to think that maybe Ukraine could be integrated in, in NATO. Is that sort of debate actually possible? When I was at the National Assembly, when I see how our debates took place, our, our, um, for example, the president talks about uh, abundance and uh, that and everything flares up. Are we not living in a democracy where in fact, individualism and social networks have led us to a situation where there's no longer a general public interest. 
there's no longer a Republican, French Republican pact. And, and in a debate, we're just always suspicious of the opponent. The um, well, it's a good thing that this type of forum does exist because uh, we know perfectly well that when a war starts, the first victim is truth and the second is nuance. And it's a little bit like in a Disney cartoon, we've got the good guys and the bad guys. And yes, Putin declared war, Putin is the aggressor, that's a fact. But we cannot say that uh, the Ukrainians have zero responsibility. So all these international issues are very complex. And if we try to simplify, simplify that into the good guys and the bad guys, uh, we'll never move forward. The other subject is that quality debates or contradictory argumentation are part of an exchange are, are, are become very full of open combat clash open clash in order to create uh, an audience and uh, to create scandal and uh, fortunately what's what is reassuring is that I, I don't think it was actually better things were better before it's just that the, I think that characterization and, and simplification simpli has always existed but I think that part of the public recognizes that this is not good and that that healthier debate would be better and, and the thrill that you might get from a flash uh, from a clash is not as constructive as a, a true explanation i am reassured by the french people's desire to be informed and I'm glad that uh, geopolitics are now part of the uh, curriculum in, in high schools. And I'm, uh, I'm reassured the fact that uh, public uh, geopolitics are still important. And uh, there is, so there is a, a that, yes, that tendency, that trend, tendency to, to characterize uh, to create character caricatures, excuse me, but and we talked about Putin, who is against uh, uh, people. People, some people tend to suggest that Putin is maybe being paid by NATO to launch this war. I don't think you should listen to those things. I think that. <laughs> True, profound reflection is something that is respected. I think that the French really want intelligent learning on these important issues and contradictory discussions. Joachim, would you like to uh, give us a, a few words of conclusion while Rachel pre uh, prepares her gives her final preparation. I think that our public are much more mature than certain media and certain politicians think they are. I think it's very important that on these complex subjects, we take the time to discuss things and our opinions may di diverge, but they're important. It's important that we hear everyone out in order to form our own opinions. Rachel Kahn, please come back up and tell us about what you thought of the discussions today and what seems what's and what's uh, what you think is the most was most important. Well, it was really a privilege for me to have been here today. I'd like to once again thank the Foundation for its remarkable work because these, these are very vibrant events. And just before everyone goes back to work and goes back to school, this sort of debate is extremely necessary. Thinking about the world on the long term 
and uh, an, um, we have to remember that it is in the in void that evil is born and this last round table inspired me to say a few words inspired by Xavier Lebray. Albert Camus said that when faced with terrifying perspective, we, we can see that peace is the only battle that's worth leading. This is not a prayer, it's an order which should be sent by the people to their governments when they have to make the choice between hell and reason. And indeed, this, this debate, this discussion today went very quickly. It passed so quickly and I learned several things. First of all, in today's disrupted world, there are disruptions that seem necessary. And I believe that we should, we should, we should cut off certain break um, disruptions. Prime Minister Zonga said this morning that we ha have to <coughs> move away from certain alliances and Denny Rank reminded us of the effort that, that required. So we talk about sustainable development, which involves social, environmental, geopolitical, political, and cultural for current and future generations. And that, that reasoning of interdependence between subjects can give the coherence that we're looking for. We also have to cut off a certain past which has been accepted from our, the representative from India, Sumit Anand, was uh, brilliant in his energy in, by which he moved to us to push us to action in a very positive way. We cannot reject humanity just because uh, some people are, of course, are have the right to make their own decisions. And then there are disruptions that kill us uh, when we when we cut off from our our ancestors, when we cut off from from art, when we cut off from those who, who constructed um, dialogue and diplomacy, cutting off listening when we when we lose ourselves in social social networks, and then there were some very powerful moments. I can't list them all, but. It's true that when Mr. Gaino talked about the legitimacy of knowledge and the legitimacy of democracy, I thought that was very important. Also, the, all of the, the, the as, various aspects of uh, uh, technolo new technologies mentioned by Mr. Bourlange. We made a report to recently about light in the modern world and and the hatred that's shared on social no networks which are um, damaging to our dialogue or to our democracies and of course uh, the subject of crypto monies, the dichotomy between individualism and uh, general interest, the fact that we need intellectual mobilization, and the fantastic Fabienne Keller with her European energy that, that renews our faith in Europe, and who talked about Lampedusa, which is an island where I was lucky enough uh, 
to make um, a movie by Marco Pantecorvo, who is a very important Italian filmmaker. And that gave me an idea because it's true that we have the UFA um, statistics that are broadcast at the same time. And why don't we have European documentaries on Lampusa, for example, or on other subjects on the same European channels in the same evening? I think that would contribute to uh, the construction of our political Europe uh, and the, the reinforcement of our European uh, values. And then we also talked about the Fran Franco-German couple who are um, together, work together. And uh, of course, we also hear that everything's not black and white, which I know, of course, personally. The issue of sovereignty that we spoke of with you, Catherine, when talking about the BRICS, it's a fundamental issue. And I would like to highlight one key point that I actually read by you, Jean-Pierre, sovereignty and solidarity. And I think those two go hand in hand, and that is the fundamental key, because the world is so complex. And united sovereignty or solidarity and sovereignty when they go hand in hand they feed into each other mankind is just a bridge not an end in itself as Nietzsche once said man is a, a bridge between beast and that which is greater than man so we have to live up to that role that is given to us. We have to push our own boundaries. We have to question ourselves and challenge ourselves because we are civilized beings, artists. We are creators, artisans of our own world. And we have to uphold that, be it for the big or the small things in life. And we have responsibility, international responsibility to strive for peace because we know how beautiful the world can be. And I would like to conclude my comments by quoting Edouard Glissant, because I believe that what he has to say ties into what we have to say today. We are part of the complexity of today's world. We have to think of the world in all that can be undecipherable. And we have to find in that ways of pulling together forms of generosity, intuition, that are in themselves fragile, shakeable, but it is that in its own right which brings us together and which preserves us, which protects us from ideology, from tight ways of thinking about the world, closed off thought. What you see of the world, when you see the beauty of the world being threatened, that needs to drive your hand and your heart and your voice. Thank you. I would now like to ask Andre Cheng to please take the floor to close our summit. We always try to have André Cheng here in attendance for our forum because it is important to have not just a view on Asia and China feeding into our discussions, but it's more than that. And we have always appreciated not only the depth of his analysis, but also his sense of humor and his bright mind. Now, today, we probably spoke not as much of China as we have in the past, but the Chinese view of the world is, is such an important view to take into account when talking about these fundamental issues. Mr. Cheng, the floor is yours. Thank you, former Prime Minister, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me to be here 
After two years absence where I was not able to attend in person, I had to join by webinar. So I would like to thank Jean-Pierre Raffarin for having invited me once again to be able to attend in person and not just by a picture on the screen. I would also like to say that there is great sorrow to see at how fast and how extensive the breakdown has been between China and the Western world. Never before has China been so poorly written about in the press, never before in the past has its message been so misunderstood, and the situation is worsening when we see what's happening in, in, in Taiwan, Hong Kong, COVID. These are all sources of disagreement between our peoples. I don't want to hear today defend or try and explain Chinese policy. What I do want to say is express how the Chinese Western relations are viewed from Beijing. What I first see is that there are two fundamental misunderstandings that are poisoning the debate and discussion between China and the West. One is based in fundamental principles, democracy, freedom, human rights. But for China, the true source of this difference lies elsewhere. Europe and the West does not like the fact that China is overtaking. Quite simply, the United States has very, came very close to losing its position as global leader. They did not like it. And with the Plaza Agreements from 1995, they forced Japan to reconsider and reevaluate its uh, currency, triggering an economic crisis that is still being felt today. Back in the time, the challenge that Japan raised was an economic challenge. Now, the one coming from China is much more vast because it touches on all domains, the economy, currencies, technology, military and ideological domains as well. And this raises a number of risks because the Chinese are very aware of the fact that they will not become the United States of the future, and that is not their goal. If China were to overtake the United States, it is simply because of the sheer size of China. GDP of China is nevertheless still far behind the United States. China can focus on further internalization of the Jinminbi. But while certain technology in China is quite astounding, Chinese understands that the American technological apparatus is based in university funding and a strong apparatus that China is far from competing against. Now, while the United States has been spread around the world in China, Chinese men and women have stayed within its boundaries. And the conflict with Taiwan goes back to 1969. But there's also an ideological shift. Xi Jinping, when speaking of the decadence of the West and speaking of the merits of the Chinese model, that some say that he would want to enforce that on the rest of the world, but that is not what China wants. Let us recall that the idea of an absolute principle is pure rhetoric from Plato. It is Western thought, it is a Western vision, it is not a Chinese vision of the world. Chinese, China does not believe in a universal model that can be applied to all. China believes that each country can find its own way forward, its own history, its own culture, its own geography, its own sense of development. And it is absurd to try and enforce a Chinese model on the Western world, just as it is in absurd to enforce a democratic model on the Chinese population. But the vision, this vision of China is so pervasive in American discourse that it is overtaking all other topics when speaking of China. However, while the United States see China as being a danger, that raises another issue. The desire of people, people seeing the desire of China to unify. Now, there have been many thinkers that we have quoted throughout today who try and analyze the unification of China. If we take it back to 2011, China as a political order 
was written about by an American specialist back in the day, comparing China to India. And they said, why is it that China was unified under an emperor in 2221 BC, whereas India was never properly unified until the United Kingdom came in. And that is because of a 500 year long war. India, from the 6th to the 3rd century BC, went through sorry, severe fighting. But China also went through a severe combative period. And it was after that combative period that came forward this notion of unity and peace through unity and putting an end to all war. Westerners, however, Americans in particular, they are aware of the importance of unity but they put it as being second ground to other values such as democracy and it is beyond the realm of conception that china could have the in the opposite order that unity precedes democracy so therefore is it a constant negotiation and negotiations with john lai in 1972 focusing on taiwan started negotiations with that phrase negotiating with two days and nights came up with the shared Chinese American declaration, the Chinese, the Shanghai declaration. Both parties recognize that there is one only China and Taiwan is part of that. For the past 50 years, that sentence is the fundamental pillar of Chinese diplomacy and it is accepted by many countries around the world. But since then, having Taiwan as part of the Chinese country, as mainland China, has always been part of Chinese mindset and all Chinese leaders have upheld that since then. But then when we look at the war in Ukraine, messages coming out of China were more and more misunderstood by the West. The West said that China was supporting Russia without question. Yet China didn't agree with the war. The inalienable uh, the, the United Nations recognizes borders and that understanding is of, of borders is fundamentally supported by China and by Xi Jinping. So why did China follow suit? Why did China support Russia? It's because of different discourse. Russia is subject to pressure and threats coming from the United States, coming from NATO, and Russia had to react, had to react to the provocation coming from them. It polarized the world because what, missed, what was missed out there was the message coming from China. What did happen? Joe Biden traveled through Asia to try and strengthen the, the alliance between China, India, Australia and the United States. And then there was the AUKUS agreement, United States, UK and Australia. It completely sidestepped France in the process. The US reached out to South Korea and Japan at the latest meeting in Madrid, saying that these two countries could join the organization, despite the fact that they were so far removed from the North Atlantic. So geostrategic, ideological threats, so therefore China moved closer to Russia so that they would not be surrounded by enemies. And what we see in much discourse is a number of references made to Bismarck, Bismarck saying you're better in a team of three than a team of two. So despite pro-Russia discourse, China in practice is not actually bolstering economic ties with Russia. It is adopting a policy which is similar to that of India, with one difference. India has not spoken outwardly in Western media, whereas China is responding to Putin-based attacks. Again, this interpretation can be contested. Why is China not increasing economic ties with Russia? The answer to that coming from a number of experts is that because the European Union and the United States being main Chinese trade partners, it would therefore threaten the Chinese economy if they were to move closer to Russia. And 
This explanation, it's tiresome because it ignores a number of facts. If we dig deeper, we can see that that argument is not as solid as it first may seem. The lead trade partner for China for the past two years is neither the European Union, nor the United States, but the ASEAN region with the RCEP that came into effect, which is the largest free trade region in the world, the Asian trade basin has grown dramatic, dramatically. The country that took the most severe sanctions against China was the United States, with no surprise. But the trade deficit is $310 billion in 2016. And therefore, TRUD took out a number of staunch decisions against China. That policy was carried through by the Biden administration. And what is the result of all of that? The trade deficit stabilized for some two years, between 310 and $320 billion in 2019 and 2020. And then it boomed again to reach $396 billion in 2021. And the trend is still on that upward trend with the recovery package being brought in by Biden, with the rise in inflation, which is becoming the main concern in the United States. And despite geopolitical tension, Biden is going to decrease taxes on Chinese products because they are the only products that are going to be able to help stem inflation in the country. Therefore, what we have to conclude from that is that the United States depend more on Chinese imports than what the Chinese economy does in terms of US imports. Now, can the same case be said for Europe? Now, what is the case in terms of those sanctions being put on China? Can it bear the brunt of them? Well, we looked at what is happening from the Ch Shanghai Agreement. Shanghai, hit by COVID, the most advanced economy close to China, was closed down entirely for some three months and brought about an economic and social crisis of great scale. What was learned from that was that Chinese power was determined to apply a zero COVID policy. But there was another message that could be taken out of that. The policy that was put in place there was that a, it's a form of stress test, a real scale, a life scale example of what would happen if China were to go through economic hardship. And the underlying message here is that China was able to survive harsh policy, the zero COVID policy. Now, in terms of a much more serious issue, China would be ready to make the sacrifices much more harsh sacrifices. So don't try and scare us away with sanctions. We will be able to bear the brunt. And when we look at the case with Taiwan, things are reaching a crux because China Taiwan relations are based on a fundamental issue, whereas Russia Ukraine is very different. The Russian intervention is an invasion. Taiwan is not an invasion, it is part of Taiwan, and many states around the world recognize that. So, therefore, why do we want to? Why would anyone want to stop reunification of the two? And this is a situation which is a de facto situation and another one which is de jure situation. China accommodated this for many years because they couldn't do otherwise, but they did not uh, make to not make their desire to bring back uh, Taiwan uh, did not hide that desire. Uh, any small incident could be have the same effect as uh, throwing a cigarette butt out of a, a car window and lighting a forest fire. Between Russia and China uh, went uh, to war tried to try to come up with a quick victory and not have to negotiate, and the other is trying to negotiate to avoid war. 
but it is absolutely essential that we avoid an, uh, an armed conflict in that area. What role can Europe play? Well, there are two possibilities. Number one is to uh, have a giant uh, democratic alliance uh, to show superior force against China, uh, which seems to be what the uh, chief of staff of the French army favors. Uh, he may be right. Uh, and he says that it would counter uh, a possible Russian-Chinese military alliance. But do we want to see a collective suicide of humanity if we all entered into a third world war? Let's look at Singapore for another solution. Maybe Singapore differently uh, has a different type of uh, opinion towards China because they don't want to have to make a choice between China and the United States. China thinks that we need to uh, diffuse uh, the politi politics of the big blocs and alliances. And with China, they think that they should, uh, we should encourage uh, dialogue between both par parties to come up with a solution and not uh, make either side a scapegoat or put them under the spotlight, which would have a negative outcome. And I think that this is a wise uh, choice. Macron, President Macron uh, says that China is not a threat to uh, North America, to the North Atlantic Alliance. Uh, and this is courageous and reasonable. Uh, it is very. It is necessary to uh, be to take things reasonably. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your words. Uh, our speaker is French, went to Polytechnique, lives in China, and has a lot uh, to say about these different subjects. I'd like to also underscore uh, cultural differences, especially what he said about unity, because for us in the Western world, we, we, we unify uh, to support a uh, football team or uh, to advance a cause, but there it is uh, a great value in the Eastern world. I remember that when I was uh, campaigning uh, with uh, a colleague in La Rochelle and the slogan was uh, being unified was, was rebelling. I remember when uh, President Hollande and met with the uh, president of China, I was there in the room and I remember that President Hollande said that he was very pleased to be, to represent a country that has a relationship of friendship with China. And the Chinese uh, leader said, oh, that's interesting because what does friendship mean to you? And so then uh, he was in, uh, President Hollande was a bit of an awkward situation and he quoted Exupéry and uh, tried to look back into the past and history. And the China Chinese leader said, for us, uh, friendship is respecting other priorities. And then he asked President Hollande, what are your priorities? And then Dr. President Hollande said, well, is to adapt to, uh, let's see, to the green transition uh, and um, digital uh, expansion, etc. And the uh, on, it, on the other side, the Chinese leader said that friendship would be to respect Chinese uh, priorities, uh, and that is our policy towards Taiwan and towards uh, Tibet, etc., etc. And so there again, we see a difference between uh, focusing on the individual versus the common good. So yes, there, it's important to understand other ideas, and so. The reason why I'm bringing this up is uh, 
when we listen to the words of Andre Cheng, after two years of COVID, we see that uh, it hasn't. We haven't been able to move forward in diplomacy. That our entrepreneurs have not been able to meet, and this can lead. This is truly dangerous because we can see that people can uh, radicalize and. Uh, making me building ties and connecting with people when you can't get on a plane when you can't see people and meet with people uh, you can get in a real uh, a very very dangerous situation so thank you mr cheng for your strong heartfelt health message that uh, is consistent with all of the messages that you have given here at our forum for the last 16 years so thank you friends i would like to say once again and how pleased we are that you could share uh, this day with us. I'd like to people at the uh, foundation for uh, their organization, for all of their hard work. Thank you for all of, to our, of our speakers, to all of our participants for working so hard on their presentations uh, and for providing us with such uh, rich content. Thank you especially to Rachel Khan for coming here today helping and, and for for thinking with us about these very difficult thorny subjects uh, our world is uh, really living through a tragic moment war is here we see other tension that could uh, make things worse but we're not in a situation where peace is guaranteed uh, Un the unexpected is very possible, uh, but the unexpected in a good way and in a bad way. So we need to hang on to our values. I see three uh, that have come through today. Number one, which is good for our planet. Uh, this is what we talked about two years ago. And the planetization, I think, where civil society plays a key role. Uh, it's something that civil society, young people, women, all living players, the people who participate in society need to, uh, to participate in the, the creation of peace in a humanized world where we protect uh, our, or protect humanity, and that is very important, uh, more important than the Washington consensus. And we also have democracies and our values. We need to say that we can improve, we can do better. We talk about uh, democracy in Israel and Japan, in South Korea. We don't talk uh, and dialogue with other democracies, even with the Germans and uh, the Americans. And there are a lot of democratic nations that do things very differently than we do. And we can really speak and discuss and have constructive discussions about best and share best practices. And I really think that we need to not rest on our laurels in the democratic system and take things uh, for granted. Because some people say that democracy is not the model of the future, but I think that democracy can improve. And this democratic consensus or a desire to improve democracy and respect other ideas should, um, should motivate us. And as Rachel said earlier, the solidarity is, is, Solidarity together. You know, yes, we saw that uh, throughout the pandemic we uh, missed, uh, we were missing certain drugs, that we were dependent on uh, certain production, but we need to work with partners, uh, close partners, especially in North Africa, with Africa, and other countries that can help and contribute. So, for instance, you know, maybe uh, certain meds like paracetamol can be uh, manufactured closer to home rather than just in China, such as Tunisia. Uh, and so, for instance, we got into a crisis where we didn't have enough paracetamol. 
sur laquelle nous devons progresser n'est pas une souveraineté d'isolement, mais une souveraineté And, de uh, this sovereignty is a sovereignty that, uh, where we help one another and we're not isolated. So there are, as Rachel said, some lights that can uh, take us to the future. It's not going to be easy, but if we want peace, we have to work towards it. Uh, so there are war school, there is war, there are a lot of people who are working towards, uh, to, for war, and we also need to have people who work for peace. And especially the way to do that is to create ties and to connect with others. And as we've spent, spoke, as we've said all day, we need to be against violence, and that is the red thread that can uh, and and the con what connects us all is to strive, endeavor for peace. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Thank you for always being here every year. So I know that a lot of people have trains to catch. Um, And so, yes, I have been able, to, we've, we've ended this forum, our, our seminar, 10 minutes early so that everyone can have their trains and have a, a fruitful debate at the same time. Thank you, everyone.